Well, hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work for the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources in the extension part, and we work for the University of Kentucky. And you know what, Billy, we're more jam-packed today than we ever have been. I know, Renee. I'm really (laughs) excited about today's show. We've got a number of interesting topics, and we're really covering a lot of kind of ground in in forestry and wildlife and natural resources today. You know, we're going to start off with um, Mr. Bobby Ammerman. Bobby is um, here in our Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and he's going to be talking about really a huge industry here in Kentucky, the forest industry. And you'll not be very surprised about how significant this industry is. And then following that, we're going to have um, Dr. Jonathan Lawrence. You know, there's some eastern tent caterpillars that have been popping up, and he's going to tell us what we need to be on the lookout for and kind of help us get ready to deal with that. And then we're going to have also Dr. Matt Springer with us, going to be talking about how to be bear wise. So, and I'm going to wrap us up with some upcoming programs for April. So, a jam packed show. Um, Mm -hmm. As always, please um, interact with us via the chat pod if you're joining us via Zoom. And if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section. Right. So, I guess let's get started. Bobby, if you'd like to turn your video and camera on, we'd greatly appreciate it. And tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about today. Yeah, so I'm just going to be giving a presentation on the size of our forest products industry here in the state and uh, the implications that it has really across the state. Um, There's really no corner of Kentucky that our industry doesn't touch, so it has a major impact on rural areas. And, um, and I think most people are going to be, be surprised by that as well as just the overall size of the industry and the economic impact it has to the state. So that's what we'll be talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, and considering half of our state is really covered in forest land and, you know, most right. of that's privately owned. So there's a lot of linkages to this forest industry. There really is. So Definitely. All right. Well, let's get started. All right. I'm going to be giving or providing the economic report for forestry for 2020. I want to start by thanking our authors, as well as our contributing author, Stuart West. Without their partnership, we could not do these reports annually. So for 2020, we're reporting uh, an estimated total economic output of $13.2 billion. And if we look at the direct output, uh, that would be at, at $9.1 billion. If we look here on the chart to the right, we can see that there's a lot of variability across our industry for 2020. Logging and primary wood manufacturing both have dropped about 1.4%, as well as paper manufacturing, uh, close to 1.7%. The one bright spot here is that secondary manufacturing has has seen an uptick uh, of almost two and a half percent. That um, that uh, that improvement in, in with the secondary wood industry uh, offsets all the losses that we've had with the other the other sectors. Um, however, even within the secondary wood manufacturing, there's a lot of variability inside that one subsector. We always like to show this map. It's a, it allows us to illustrate how, how um, diverse our industry is in terms of, of across the state and all the rural areas that it impacts. Um, we currently have 671 industries. Those are identified industries in our state and 112 counties. We probably could identify in all 120, um, you know, if we could find them, but we know of at least 671. There are 3,000 master loggers in our, in our state as well, and the uh, shade of green in each individual county illustrates the, the density of those master loggers. Factors affecting the forest sector. Well, for one, again, I've already mentioned it, but we have a lot of variability across the industry. Uh, our oak exports declined in 2020. Uh, COVID has been a big concern, not only with trying to keep, you know, a healthy workforce in the state um, and not shutting down any of our mills, but also um, the how it's impacting uh, uh, global economies that we sell a lot of our wood product to. Um, we was fortunate that, that the governor did not um, or uh, issued that uh, forestry or the forest industry was an essential industry and we didn't have to shut down uh, back in the spring. Um, but it still has had a big impact on, on our industry. Um, and we currently have a shortage of log supply. That's a big concern, as well as a closure of a paper mill just, just outside of Kentucky in Bristol, Tennessee. Um, the closing of that mill is impacting the residual removal from our sawmills in eastern Kentucky, as well as low-grade timber sales. Uh, barrel demand did remain good throughout 2020, as well as uh, railroad ties. Now, here's a bar chart that 
that shows uh, hardwood sawlog production for our state in 2020. And you can see that we're down about one and a half percent to 1.4 percent from 2019. Now, one of the things impacting those low numbers in the primary industry is, is uh, housing starts. Much of our wood products that go into, um, or much of our wood products is sold into uh, new housing. And so as new housing goes, so does our industry. And you can see here in 2020, we've had a fairly significant decline. Um, this graph here shows delivered log prices. Now, if we showed the prices for all of our, our delivered logs, it would just get very uh, congested and confusing. So um, we've pulled out two species to look at, white oak and red oak. And, it, and they're really interesting species to look at because if you look back here in 2006, you can see uh, red oak actually sold or had a higher value than what white oak did. You know, white oak being the gray line here, red oak being the red line. And if we look at it today, white oak is more than double red oak. Now, one thing I will point out here, this graph is not perfectly reflecting um, what we're seeing in the red oak market here in the last few months. We've actually seen somewhat of an uptick uh, in red oak. And this graph is a little bit delayed, not showing it, mainly because we're looking at year to year, not month to month. Now, here's a bar chart that shows from June of 2018 to October 2020. Uh, it shows hardwood lumber prices. Let me rephrase that. It shows green hardwood lumber prices uh, since June 18 of 2020 uh, until October uh, 2020. And we can see here real quick that red oak is, is, has done very well uh, since 2018. The walnut's done real well as well, and including white oak is kind of holding, holding its own up 6%. Overall, we've seen price increases of about 2% across the board on average. Now this graph here is red and, and, and white oak green lumber prices from the same time period. And um, the, the uh, yellow line here is, is white oak and the red line here is red oak. And um, again, we're kind of using this chart to kind of show this latest uptick in red oak prices. So you can see here from say August up to October, We've seen quite a bit of an increase in the price of red oak. So we're really hoping that continues. Now, if we forecast uh, log and lumber prices out through 2021, um, we think stump or stumpage prices are going to, going to improve uh, due to, to log shortages. We think we've already seen a little bit of improvement. We think that's going to continue throughout 2020. Uh, and again, mainly due to just, just log shortages. Um, that's log shortages is due to, to, uh, to the market. The, the uh, stumpage price has been so low the last few years that um, it's really drove, drove a shortage up and, and, and slowly started to uh, improve stumpage prices. Black walnut should continue to do well through 2021. And um, we are a little bit worried about sawmill production. It could, could fall a little bit due to the mills just not, getting, just not getting the log volumes that they need. Now, one thing that's really uh, guys concerned is we've seen a closure of a paper mill in Bristol, Tennessee, Northeast Tennessee. And we, we, had, we have much or a lot uh, chip mill and low grade material that come from Eastern Kentucky and flow into that plant. And, um, and so we're really concerned about that. That could have a, a negative impact on low grade timber sales, uh, as well as sawmills ability to remove the residuals. Um, in addition, it's gonna impact the landowner's ability to use best management practices in the woods. So uh, we're really concerned about this. Um, we already had a, a, a terrible market for low grade lumber and logs. And uh, now that's only gonna get worse with the closure of this mill, unfortunately. Now we say closure, it's not really a closure. They're revamping their production. They're gonna make a different product, but all the input's gonna be recycled now uh, instead of, of raw wood. So it's not gonna help us at all in terms of, of our industry here in the state. Now, if we take a quick look at tie logs, we can see uh, where we started out in 2008, where we're at today, just a continual improvement. However, we can see here in, from 2019 to 2020, we can see a slight decline or slight softening in prices for oak ties, okay? And we think that's gonna continue through 2021, a softening of the market, but there'll still be good, good sales, strong sales. Uh, CCX is still uh, replacing uh, railroad ties and the, the big project they had going on. However, we do see that it's coming to an end uh, slowly. So eventually, uh, probably, you know, in 2021, it looks like 
they, they may have that project pretty much wrapped up. They'll still be re replacing ties though. So uh, we still think the market will be, will be decent moving forward. Now, white oak stave logs, uh, let's take a quick look at barrel production. You know, kind of like, uh, kind of like the um, <clears throat> tie logs, the, the, the stave logs, if just you can see where it started here in 2011 uh, and where it is today, it's more than doubled in value. And uh, we think that trend is going to continue. There's not going to be anything slow that down, we don't think. Um, so the demand should continue, should be real strong through 2021. And uh, we should see uh, an increased uh, production um, uh, in staves as well as cooperage here in the state, just because we've had so many new stave mills and cooperage mills um, start up uh, in recent years here in Kentucky. Now, let's take a look at exports real quick. Um, 2020 exports are actually down 20% compared to 2019. Uh, if we look right here in the, at the same time frame, September to September from 2019 to 2020, we can see that in 2019, we was at 260 million in exports. And now we're down to 209. And again, these are wood products exports out of Kentucky. Uh, this, pie chart, this pie chart breaks down those products and what we're shipping overseas. You can see wooden casks or barrels, wood barrels, white oak barrels are by far our leading export wood product uh, followed, uh, followed behind by oak lumber. And um, you can see here, here's where all that loss is for our exports. It's all in oak lumber. Matter of fact, it's down 22% in total. And here's an, uh, just a bar chart that kind of illustrates that even further, the reduction in oak lumber exports uh, through September, 2020. Uh, here we are in 2019 in September, we're at 50 million. And now here in September in 2020, we're, at, we're all the way down to 39 million. Now, a lot of this loss is, <clears throat> is due to, uh, uh, to China's uh, sluggish market, as well as COVID. COVID is a big reason why uh, globally, um, you know, the economy is down and, and we're just not able to export as much as we were uh, a year ago or even two years ago. Hopefully with the lifting of the tariffs, as well as uh, getting COVID out of the way, uh, these economies will recover and, and we'll, we'll get, get a lot of that back. Now, uh, we always like to show this. Um, and, and again, I, I wanna say that, <clears throat> you know, we, we kind of use some, spec, some speculative math here to come up with these values. So, um, but the idea here is still, it's still sound. So, if we, st if we start with $1,000 of uh, stumpage value, and by the time that material moves through all the different operations, logging, sawmill and chipping, secondary, and even, even the residues that's produced um, from the uh, main manufacturing, uh, all that added value is gonna equal to, to about 22 or 23 times the initial value that we started with. And the key point to this is, is all this value added will be, will be local value added. Nearly all these materials are processed um, within, within miles of where they're harvested. So that's a, definitely a positive thing for the state. So wrapping this up, um, in summary, looking uh, our outlook through 2021, we think there's gonna to continue to be a lot of variability across our industry. We're concerned about the shortage of logs, especially going into the winter for our sawmills. We think that could have a negative impact on production. Um, as well as log and lumber prices. Now, the good thing about this is, is that the shortage is probably gonna raise log and lumber prices. That could be a positive for landowners. It could improve stumpage values quite a bit. Um, white oak demand will continue throughout the year. Matter of fact, we'll probably increase. Tile log should hold your own throughout the year. And as I said earlier, we're, we're still gonna, we're gonna be very concerned about what happens to our low grade markets and this, these sawmills, their ability to remove the residuals from their production um, with that closure of that Bristol mill. So, so we're gonna be watching that pretty closely uh, and hopefully that won't be as bad as we think. And then all eyes are gonna be on COVID. If we, you know, if we globally can, can solve this COVID issue, get some of these markets uh, strong again, like in China and Europe um, with the lifting of the tariffs, um, we can see those exports really improve. Bobby, you covered a lot of ground there. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully everybody's still awake. Yeah, hey. Yes, we are. <laughs> it is so impressive to me. I get a chance to be around this industry quite on a regular basis, but really the, the breadth of it across the state is really impressive. 
Hey, Bobby, several times, I mean, well, throughout the whole thing, you're mentioning 2020, 2020, you know, and I'm afraid some people might go, if that was last year, why would you be mentioning 2020? This is 2021. Can you explain that just a little bit? Well, you know, we're only, you know, basically three months into 2021. So we kind of do this on a year to year basis. So um, we're, we're looking at the data up through the end of, of each year. So so that's why we're referring to 2020. Okay. Um, we even mentioned 2019 in the, you know, in the, in the uh, video and that that's basically just to compare what we've seen in 2020 as, as compared to what we saw in 2019. So, um, you know, basically just, just run it from year to year and kind of wait till the end of the year to accumulate the data and um, make some of these determinations. All right. Well, thank you for being on. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, ain't no problem. Yeah. It's good to remind folks just how big and important that industry is for sure. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I live in Eastern Kentucky and I think it's uh you know, I'm driving into work this morning and, uh, you know, I'm a little bit late as usual. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, I got behind a log truck going about, you know, 10 mile an hour. <laughs> and um, it's real easy to get very frustrated. But then you think, well, you know, you know, that, lo that load of logs is going to turn into thousands and thousands of, of value added to to our area. And then, uh, you know, you have a second thought about, well, you know, this is not so bad that it slowed me down, you know. <laughs> And, and, you know, another thing is we see a lot more logging trucks now in this part of the world than we do coal trucks, a lot more. Mm -hmm. I rarely see a coal truck anymore. So the industry uh, for a lot of our rural areas has really become important to the economic um, opportunities and, and impacts that we have, have in these areas. So uh, very important industry. You know, Bobby, I'll add to that, um, you know, if you contrast coal to trees, you know, trees are going to grow back on their own in a pretty quick short time uh, relative to coal um, being regenerated. So uh, much more renewable in that regard. We did have a question about why did the Bristol site close? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, we pretty much know. I mean, it's just like what you're doing right now. Uh, you know, we're listening to, um, to basically a webinar or a meeting presentation uh, electronically, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if we was in a meeting, we'd probably handed out a bunch of bunch of paperwork, right? And PowerPoints printed right. off, and all kinds of various stuff, and this and that. And so now all that stuff's getting sent sent around electronically, and we're just not using as much paper products uh, as we traditionally have, and we're seeing that go down uh, significantly every year. Now, um, there is one positive to some of the things we've seen with COVID and, and some changes in the marketplace. And that is packaging. Um, you know, the fact that we're ordering so much more stuff on Amazon and other places that we're seeing a lot more things shipped. So there is some uh, improvement in that particular area of, of you know, the, the paper industry, uh, but it's nowhere near offsetting what we're losing with traditional copy paper and printing and magazines and newspapers and all that that we're seeing kind of going by the wayside. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for being on today. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, no, no. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Thanks, you, Bobby, very much. All right. Switching gears to some Cheers. insects a little bit. Yeah. Um, we got Dr. Jonathan Larson. Um, he's a UK entomologist and um, a good friend of the From the Woods Today show. Um, Jonathan, glad to have you with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back. Yeah. I told him that, you know, every time he puts out a press release, we're going to call him up. <laughs> you know, so, so here we go. We'll have more yeah. bugs coming on. There's always bugs. There's always right. bugs to bang around. <laughs> Tell us uh, a little I can, bit about what you're going to talk about. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about Eastern tent caterpillar here today. So it's a, it's a pest that people have a lot of interest in here in the state of Kentucky. I think that has a lot to do with reproductive mare loss from 20 or 22 years ago. And I just wanted to show some of the different things that we know about this, this caterpillar. They are getting ready to hatch here in this area or have already hatched. Um, it tends to be around the time where forsythia is kind of in its highest bloom. You can check online. There's an Eastern Tent Caterpillar degree day map that they put out that's got a national scope. And it really shows you uh, in good real time sort of when they expect it to happen and then when it has occurred and they have different colors for the map. But this is the insect that we're talking about. I think it's kind of a beautiful caterpillar. They have that kind of blackish body with two blue stripes that go down each side, kind of orange markings across the top. And then this very prominent white stripe down the back. They're redheads. They are gingers, I guess you could say. My daughter has red hair uh, and she likes these caterpillars because they kind of match up with her. But uh, they do have that kind of striking uniqueness to them, kind of contrasting colors. 
They are something that builds a compact nest. It doesn't get too big. Uh, it can expand to quite a, quite a large size, but when they start it, it's usually pretty tight and tidy. And they're down in the crooks and crotches of the branches. And this is in contrast to one of the other caterpillars that we get a lot of questions about, uh, which is the fall webworm. Those build over the tips of the branch. They go over the new growth while these are further down in the tree in those crooks and crotches. So they will expand the nest as the caterpillars grow and it can get closer to the edge, but they start down there in those crooks and crotches. They like wild cherry, they like apple and crab apple. The caterpillars do feed uh, about three times a day. They'll leave when it's cooler. The nest is there to protect them from extreme cold and extreme heat. And they'll use it sort of as a huddle spot when we have days like today where it's starting to cool down. And they do extend the nest as they grow, as I kind of mentioned. They keep making that silk which they produce and they will make it bigger and bigger as their needs indicate. They spent the winter like this. And this is one of the things that I think makes this caterpillar pretty interesting is they're able to get a jump on the season compared to some of the other caterpillars because they overwinter as an egg. The egg mass is wrapped around the branches and the twigs of the tree. It is about 150 to 400 eggs on the inside. And they're very sparkly. You can actually kind of see them if you're looking close to the tree. It looks like, I think it looks like pyrite or gum that's mixed with fool's gold and has been wrapped around the tree. It kind of looks like those things we used to put on pencils and pins, the like foamy grip pieces that we would be able to hold on to. And you can find these in the tree. And one tip to use in terms of getting rid of them is to destroy the egg masses as you locate them. So it's something that gets on horse farms, it gets in woodlands, it gets in all different kinds of areas, but they're not the biggest pests in the world. It's usually just sort of a cosmetic issue they can cause some defoliation since it's so early in the season, the tree can usually grow back and be fine. We don't usually see tree mortality with this, but Kentucky does have this added wrinkle of reproductive marrow loss syndrome, which this caterpillar was associated with. The horses were ingesting them and it was doing something to the mares and they were losing their foals. So there's lots of options for control. We can talk about that if you'd like, but basically there are some injections or some soil treatments that you can do for them. Uh, and then like the benzoate, which is kind of the main EAB emerald ash borer product that's out there. Thiamethoxam, imidacloprid have all been used. I know that it works. I've seen the evidence of that. You can see these treated webs on the left and the non-treated tree on the right. So you could still see caterpillars in a treated tree. It's just not gonna expand the nest. The caterpillars aren't gonna get very big. They're gonna get wiped out and be taken care of. But I, I think it's a little bit overkill to be doing that. I don't wanna ding anything if there's people out there that do this, but that's a, that's a lot of work for something that's mostly a cosmetic issue and can be very widespread. And I think there are other sort of non-chemical options that work just as well. So one is to do, I call it the cotton candy method. Once you see the nest, you just get a good long stick and you shove it into the web and you twirl it around in there and yank it out. And it'll look like you have this big squirmy mass of cotton candy at the end of your stick. You can take a bite out of it, I guess, if you want. Maybe don't, it will be full of caterpillar poop and things, but it's gonna remove that web. It's gonna open it up. Lots of other things are gonna come in there and eat those caterpillars. They tend not to do very well after their web has been destroyed. You can blow it out with a water hose. I mentioned scraping off the egg masses. That's another thing that helps. Pruning is something that can be done. It's harder to do when you're talking about down in the crooks and crotches of the branches rather than with the new growth like fall webworm. But you can try and cut some of the sticks out or cut, try and cut the web out and prune it out from the, the tree itself. And if you catch them early enough in the season, if we go out in the next couple of weeks and treat a tree with something like BT or spinosad, then you will also get good control. The bigger the caterpillar gets, the harder it is to kill, but these organic options do work well in this early treatment window. The only thing that you can't use and that I won't recommend is fire. I am amazed every year how many questions I get about, can't I just burn these out of my tree? Can't I just burn fall webworm out of my tree? You can, but then you're the pest that is causing your tree harm. And I don't think that it's a very good idea to, to apply flame or diesel fuel to the plant. So please don't get a blowtorch or anything and take it to the tree. There are all these other options that we've already kind of talked about. Well, thank you very much for that. We greatly appreciate it. And, you know, I know you mentioned about getting rid of them. You gave several different ways, but um, 
for example, does it hurt the tree if you don't get rid of them or should you try to really get rid of anything that you see? It, it's something that we want to provide the, the more kind of responsible control options for people who really want to get rid of them. But ultimately, no, you don't normally have to do a whole lot for this. I mean, if you have all of your trees infested, if it's an outbreak year, which we do get every 10 or 11 years, um, then that's something that's different. You could go out and take care of them then. But by and large, this is going to go, it's going to happen in the spring, they'll disappear, the tree will regrow, and it'll be fine. It's more of a cosmetic or kind of an annoyance issue. It, it, Jonathan, I was um, noticing, you mentioned a lot of trees that were impacted were kind of in that rosaceae family. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also saw you had a picture on an oak tree that had some of them too. Will you talk about kind of, um, they, you know, that host selection, I guess? They, <laughs> yeah, they've got a wide host range. They like hawthorn, they like maple, they like cherry, peach, pear, plum. Um, the picture of the oak may have been of a different tent maker, but uh, I'd have to go back and look. But yeah, they do love lots of different things. They have a wide host range. They're one of the pests that we kind of are worried about as we see climate change become the specter in the future. It would be an insect that because of its wide host range and its early spring timing, it could actually become worse in the future. It could have more of an advantage compared to some of its competitors because of its ability to eat anything and get a head start on all of its competitors. Yeah. You know, you think about orchards and stuff, you know, people that have a lot of apple trees and stuff, they might have to be really on their toes with this um, critter. That's a little different. Yeah, we would want to recommend some of those control options there today, but I didn't know if, if there were a lot of orchardists on the... On the <laughs> They're probably out tending it, their it, trees right, right now. Yeah, it's <laughs> from the woods. It's not from the orchard today. So, okay. yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Do any wildlife eat these? So some things will, yeah. Uh, uh, anything with a mouth that is part that is kind of carnivorous and doesn't just focus on plants. So yeah, squirrels, birds, if they can get to them, that tent does help to protect them. But when you cut it open or poke it open with a stick, there are things that'll go in there and eat them. There are other things we don't want to eat them, like the horses that I mentioned. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Jonathan. We greatly appreciate it. And yeah, I'm sure time. we'll have you back on. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've adopted you as part of our family. I, I, I do feel the love. <laughs> Someday after COVID, there'll be kumbaya time. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Really do appreciate you, Dr. Yeah. Larson. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> very speaking of wildlife <laughs> oh yeah i'm not bringing on our own dr matt springer um, matt will bears eat those caterpillars <laughs> i mean maybe if they can get out on the branches far enough without falling off the tree so, Tell um, a bit about what you're going to talk about today yeah so uh not so much today in the next two days, but it was quite warm yesterday at the very least. And uh, it's the time of year when we're going to start seeing bears come out and get more active. And uh, that sometimes means uh, trouble. Um, they are incredibly hungry after probably several months of not consuming much at all uh, and are going to be looking for um, as many calories as they can possibly consume in as little time as possible. Uh, and that sometimes means your garbage uh, or your pet food or whatever else they can fit in their mouth. Tent yeah. caterpillars. <laughs> That'd be good. Uh, um, and you did record this earlier um, this year, but I just wanted, it still is applicable today. And so we just wanted to go ahead and show it for people who might be dealing with bears. <laughs> Yep, it should be some tips on how to hopefully not have a bad experience in the next couple months. Yes. Yeah. No whammies, right? We want no, no whammies, whammies. No whammy. Yes. You and Jonathan need to get together and train these bears on how to eat these caterpillars. <laughs> All right. I'll get I'll get it going. All right. Hello, this is Dr. Matt Springer, Wildlife Extension Specialist for the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how you can be bear wise in eastern Kentucky. Black bears have grown in population number over the last decade or two in, in Kentucky and will continue to do so uh, at this current time. What this means for you is we have to be a little bit smarter about how we can behave to make it less likely to have a bear issue where you live or where you are active. Kentucky's black bear, the largest native omnivore to the state, was once very abundant throughout the Commonwealth. However, overhunting and loss of habitat depleted the populations. The last few decades have seen strong growth in their numbers, and therefore we are starting to see a lot more human-wildlife interactions that are both positive and negative. Bears thrive in the hardwood forests abundant through eastern Kentucky. 
utilizing both mature forested stands all the way down to early successional forested stands to meet their food and cover needs to survive. Vegetation, insects, and mast are primary food items for these animals. Things like acorns and previously American chestnuts were main portions of their diet. In summer, things like berries and insects make up the majority of it. Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources intensely manages their population, consistently monitoring their health, reproduction, and movement of the animals in the state. One of the main goals of the agency is to reduce bear-human conflicts. The best way to do that is to make you bear wise or bear aware. Look for signs of bear in the area like scat, scratchings on trees, or tracks left in or around where you will live or are active. Remember that bear's closest relative is a raccoon, so anything you can imagine a raccoon getting into is a good possibility a bear can also do that. So we want to make you more bear wise here in Kentucky. There's basically six easy steps to follow for your residents. First and foremost, we never ever want to feed or approach a bear. This causes them to be less afraid of humans in the long run and potentially increases the chances of having a conflict. The next steps are really based on our own behavior. We can do things like secure our food garbage or recycling and make sure we put it out so it's picked up relatively quickly so bears have a low likelihood of finding it and getting into it. If you feed wildlife like birds, do so only in the winter when bears are less active. If you are feeding when bears are active, be on the lookout for bears and remove the food source before bears find it. Thoroughly clean your grill to make sure that the smells of food or any food scraps are removed from the area around your residence. When feeding pets or livestock outside, make sure you securely lock up any of the food that you use to feed them. This food will attract bears and or raccoons to the area and cause a problem potentially for your pets or your residents. These behaviors will help keep your residents safe from bears. There's also guidelines on how to keep yourself safe while active outdoors in areas with bears. Please refer to bearwise.org for that information. Now, remember this information will go a long way in helping reduce the possibility of having issues with bears this winter and also next spring. Remember that these small steps will help to go a long way in both protecting yourself, your property, and the bears. A fed bear is a dead bear, and we want you to take every step possible to becoming bear wise in Kentucky. Thanks, Matt. We greatly appreciate that presentation. And, you know, I know my grandmother used to live in eastern Kentucky, and she had a huge pack of birdseed on her front porch. Well, birdseed was end up halfway up the road because <laughs> a bear had gotten into it. <laughs> So that was, it's always interesting to find, you know, and I have several family members that live in Harlan and they, they show me videos of bears all the time. So they're interesting creatures. <laughs> yeah, they, they um, can find uh, food from very far off. Otherwise, if they couldn't do that, then, um, you know, it's, they wouldn't be alive, um, but their nose is a, a very strong um, source of, of guidance to them. Uh, even if you have things locked up, unfortunately, they sometimes are able to find the shed that, that, you know, dog food is in and, and they will try to get in there. Um, the biggest thing though, is if they're unsuccessful, they tend to learn quickly that it's not going to be worth the effort and they'll move on and try to find uh, food elsewhere. Uh, it's when that they have, that they get success, you know, if they found dog food on the porch earlier, they know there's dog food around and they're going to put a little more effort and potentially cause some damage. Um, and absolutely, we do not want to ever feed these guys, um, not only for safety reasons, um, you know, bears aren't that big. Our, our big adult bears are, you know, a male might be 350 pounds, the females like 150. They're not huge. Uh, they're not as big as people think, but I still would not want to wrestle 150 pound sow. She would throw me against the, you know, throw me and I mean, the claws are, you're still talking two inches long. So um, don't want to be around them. Matt, we talked about bears in eastern Kentucky, but is or can we find um, black bears here in other parts of the state? Well, I believe last year we had walk right, one walk right in front of our building. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether, <laughs> you know, I still think Dr. John Cox let it go. Um, <laughs> no, Emotion, they, right? yes, exactly. Um, so they, especially um, late spring, early summer, 
uh, the males will uh, leave mom, the two-year-old males will leave mom and travel very far distances in search of a new home range. Uh, so we're seeing bears, uh, I believe two years ago, there's one reported in Todd County. So far Western Kentucky. Um, every year now, it seems we have them coming up the Kentucky River that, that gets into uh, Jesmond, Fayette, uh, Franklin County. Uh, Bernheim had one not too long ago. Uh, so they're, they're expanding their range as their population slowly grows. Um, but right now, I mean, basically anything in Northeast Kentucky, I would consider bear territory. So you get up anywhere east of, of Boone County is all fair game. Um, and I would say Boone County is also fair game for some of those uh, males as they start taking a walk. So um, good chunk of our, our state is now, you know, bear country per se. So everybody needs to kind of be on the lookout and be aware. Yeah. So, you know, yes. And, and a lot of these um, methods will go a long way in dealing with raccoon issues. So mm -hmm. everyone's got raccoons. Yeah. That's yeah. So we could always deal with less raccoon problems. So, you know, uh, just look at it as you're dealing with raccoon problems and the side effect is you're not going to have any bear problems or you have yeah, less likely. Our neighbor bear. just trapped one the other day <laughs> here in yeah. Bay County. So Yep. Um, you know, so one thing you mentioned was the grill. I never thought about the grill being an issue. And I'm sure a lot of people haven't thought because they're like, there's no food on it, you know. Oh, yeah. Anything with that aroma. Uh, I mean, you think about what there's probably some grease dripping somewhere in there that you were just, you know, you could be as um, cleaning not as possible. There's going to be something left there that can have an aroma that may cause a problem. Uh, obviously, the stronger the food smell the more likely you are to have a bear come in if you're living in bear territory. Uh, but just a little bit can be enough to, to get up their curiosity and, and uh, have them come close to your porch or, you know, leave a door open. And all of a sudden we've, we've seen the videos and social media of bears walking in houses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had that experience when I lived in Pennsylvania, I opened the back door and there was a bear standing on my back porch because I had a pear tree and some apple trees in my backyard. And, um, I think I climbed my house quicker than the bear climbed the tree. But, um, you know, it's at your attention. Yeah. It got my attention. Yeah. Um, so they, they are, they're ones that they will follow their nose. Um, and you know, you don't want to reward them, um, around human dwellings because then they will be less likely, uh, to be scared of you for sure. All right. Well, thank you, Matt, for that presentation. We greatly yeah. appreciate it. All right. Well, moving on to our always popular tree of the week. Yeah, no doubt. We have a Laurie Thomas. Um, she works really hard every week to put these segments together for us. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, a beautiful one um, that she's going to talk about today. Yeah, so I wanted to do something that is flowering right now in the woods, and um, hopefully <laughs> this cold weather is not going to zap them, but um, yeah, and we're doing um, one that you may not even realize what it is, because it's just a lovely white flower, but it's the American plum. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the American plum. American plum, Prunus americana, is a member of the Rosaceae family and one of 30 Prunus species found in the United States. It is the most broadly distributed wild plum in North America. It's also known as American wild plum, wild plum, red plum, and goose plum. It is a small tree to large deciduous shrub that grows between 15 to 30 feet tall and up to 12 inches in diameter, and it grows its tallest in the southern part of its range. Trees typically have a single trunk that are often that's often crooked with a broad reaching crown. It is a moderately fast growing tree and short lived. It is not very tolerant of shade and will decline with canopy closure, so it's uncommon in a late successional forest. American plum has very attractive spring flowers and edible fruit that are an important wildlife food. American plum is a widely distributed tree from southern Canada south to Florida with scattered populations as far west as New Mexico and Montana. It is mostly a woodland species but can also be found in shrublands, pastures, riparian zones, and the edges of swampy habitats as well as disturbed areas such as roadsides. It commonly forms thickets that can be almost impenetrable where there is enough light available. It grows best in nutrient-rich, relatively deep, well-drained, moist soils. It is an attractive tree or shrub in the landscape and used for screening, natural barriers, or erosion control, but its thorny growth and root suckering habits should be considered when planting. The leaves are deciduous, alternately arranged on the twig, and simple in form. 
The leaves are oval to elliptical in shape and about three to four inches long. They have finely serrated margins and the leaf tip is sharply pointed. During the growing season, they are green above and slightly paler beneath. Fall color ranges from pale yellow to red. The branches often have numerous spines and thorns. American plum is monoecious, which means a tree has both male and female flowers. The showy flowers are white and occasionally tinged with pink, and they're very fragrant. They have five petals, and they're about typically one inch across, and usually in small clusters. The flowers bloom early as the leaves are emerging or even before the leaves have emerged. The flowers are insect pollinated and with honeybees being one of the primary pollinators. The fruit is a round, fleshy, edible droop, which is a one-seeded, fleshy fruit. The plum is typically about one inch across and it's usually yellowish to reddish purple. And the plum usually has a glaucous bloom, which means it's covered with a light, whitish, waxy substance. The seed inside the fleshy part of the fruit is like a smooth, compressed stone. They are sour to tart, sweet in taste. The fruits may be solitary or in clusters, and the fruit ripens in mid to late summer, and the seeds are dispersed by mammals, gravity, and birds, as evidenced by seedlings popping up along fence rows. Trees produce good crops every other year, and American plum also spreads from root sprouts and from root crown sprouts. The bark of American plum is initially reddish gray, smooth with many horizontal lenticels. As the tree ages, the bark becomes rough with irregular ridges and exfoliating curling strips. American plum provides food and cover for wildlife. The fruit is eaten by a variety of mammals and birds, including coyote, black bear, fox, grouse, blue jays, brown thrashers, and grackles. The trees provide browse for white-tailed deer and rabbits, and the flowers provide nectar and pollen for butterflies and bees. Due to its thicket-forming habit, American plum provides nesting cover for birds and small mammals as well. American plum is recommended for its drought resistance and is widely planted in shelter belts in the western plains. They are also useful to help control soil erosion. The trees are an attractive addition to landscape planning, but the thorny growth and root suckering characteristics should be considered. The fruit is widely used for jams, jellies, fruit leather, and they're an important tree for honeybees. Currently, as of 2021, there is not a national champion or a Kentucky state champion listed for American plum. Now for a few fun facts about American plum. American plum was extensively used by Native Americans, and researchers speculate that they were cultivating these trees near their villages long before Europeans arrived. Native Americans used the fruit fresh, they cooked it, and they dried it. They also used it for medicines and the roots to make a red dye. It is found in about 100 counties in Kentucky, according to the USDA plant status base. The scientific genus name Prunus is from the Greek prinos, which means plum or cherry, and the species name Americana. Americana means from America. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park or neighborhood, and see this flowering American plum. Thank you, Lori. We greatly appreciate that presentation, and that is a beautiful tree. It reminded me of an apple, Lori. The flowers look so much it, like an apple flower. It does. Yeah, it does. Now, is this the same plums you buy in the store? No. Oh, no, oh, this okay. is a wild plum. So um, those are cultivated and, you know, they've been selected for size and juiciness and fruit. I know, I think Kathy had asked if it was the same as the damson, the damson plum, and it's not. It, that's a, a more of a, it, that was cultivated, but it's not the same thing. This is the Prunus Americana. Okay, someone wanted to know why there is no state champion. I don't know. Um, I thought that was strange too. There, the last one that was listed nationally, I, I can't see what was listed before here um, in the state, but listed nationally was in 2009 and it was in Fairfax, Virginia. And my thought is, is they're relatively short lived and no one's just, you know, they don't live for very long. That was the national champion. It died. No one's gone back out to look for another one. And a lot of times people don't notice or think about them as being large trees. I know we didn't, because um, we had at McConnell Springs, the national champion smooth and staghorn sumax, and you wouldn't have, they just, they look small. So they don't stand out like a really large tree. And that may be part of the reason. And someone wanted to know if you can propagate them from suckers. 
I do not know. I'm not, I don't know much about propagation. That would be something we would want to add and maybe um, Josh Kite um, and see what we can do with those. Okay. Well, we can always get back to them. Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Lori. We greatly appreciate you coming on. Yeah, sure. no doubt. I know you work hard on those. Appreciate it. It's a great um, addition to the show. Definitely. All right, Billy. We have a lot of upcoming programs coming up um, for the upcoming months, and you're going to let us know about April. Yeah, so I'm going to share kind of our upcoming program segment for, and we're going to focus on some stuff that's going on in April. Um, great opportunity for some of the, to get involved in some of the other things that we've got, we're part of here at um, UK Forestry Natural Resources Extension. So, um, so let's start with um, this first one, and we have a Kentucky Woodland Owner Update. This is kind of a new development. The Kentucky Woodland Owners Association um, is partnering with us uh, here at the UK Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and we are um, trying to um, give a, a periodic update on some things that are going on. And um, Jimmy Sizemore happens to be a board member of KWA, and he is going to be doing an update on the American Chestnut. He's also a member of the Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. So he's been involved with a lot of that work. Um, so I know there's a lot of interest in this. So um, please feel free to join us on April 13th. Um, that'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Should last about an hour or so. Um, and then coming up on April 20th, um, our very own Chad Nyman is going to be presenting a wood identification program. Um, this too will occur at 7 p.m. again April 20th and it's going to be via Zoom. And um, Chad's going to be talking about wood identification this is, um, you know, with 100 plus species of um, native trees here in Kentucky, wood identification can be challenging, um, but uh, Chad's going to try to break it down and make it a little bit easier um, and provide you some resources that you'll be able to kind of do on your own. And I do want to acknowledge that this is part of an ongoing Mountain Zoom series um, that some of our county extension agents have initiated um, down in Harlan and Letcher County, along with um, Wise County, Virginia. So it's really a multi-state effort. So um, please join us on April 20th at 7 p.m. if you're interested in learning more about wood identification. Um, and then I want to mention um, some youth forestry and natural resource educational opportunities that are ongoing. Um, we have the week-long um, Kentucky Forest Leadership Program. Um, they're still accepting applications. Um, it is pretty limited, so if this is something you're, you know of a high school um, student that might be interested in exploring forestry or wildlife or entomology, this is an opportunity for them to really get a really hands-on, week-long, intensive course um, about those topics. And the neat thing about this is they all work together. Together. Um, so it's a great experience. And for the first time, um, it's going to be held down at Robinson Forest. So this is UK's Robinson Forest in Eastern Kentucky, um, a great opportunity to check that out. Um, and ongoing, Laurie has the Kentucky 4-H Virtual Forestry Field Days. Um, that's available at any time. Great opportunity for clubs or people um, that have youth at home um, that may even not be part of 4-H, but a great opportunity for that. And then she also has going on the 4-H um, NRESCI Academy. This is a three-year program for um, high or middle school students. Um, and each year they focus on a different topic. So um, those are some great opportunities for some of the youth out there. So if you're aware of some youth Youth with interest in forestry or wildlife or natural resources, um, please bring these programs to their attention. And then I want to wrap up with our From the Woods segments that we've got. These are the main segments coming up in April. Um, the first, first week in April there, we're going to hit on that Black Vulture project. Uh, Matt Springer's been working on this for a while. He's going to give us updates what's going on there. And then on the 14th, we're going to have Cliff Duray from the Office of Surface Mining um, at the federal office. He's going to be talking about the Appalachian Regional Reforestation Initiative. So there's a lot of work to try to get some of these old surface mines um, reclaimed into trees. And there's some special techniques that have to be done because of some of the compaction and other things. So um, this is a great opportunity to learn about some of that work. And we may know of some folks out there with some um, previously mined land that could benefit from it. And then on April 21st, we're going to be celebrating Earth Day. Um, we'll have an Earth Day special on that. And then we're going to wrap up the month of April with the maples of Kentucky. So there's quite a few maples, and Laurie's going to break down um, how you can tell one maple from another maple because they are quite similar, um, but there are certainly some unique um, characteristics to each. So um, that's our upcoming programs for April, and we hope you can join us for more than one. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you all online during these programs. All right. You know, Billy, I was just thinking about this when you were showing those those dates um, on 
a four eight. That was our first show. So we've been doing this for almost a year now. So, so it's just hard to believe. And time has went by very fast when it comes to the show. Well, and you know, Renee, a big acknowledgement to our audience out there. If it wasn't Definitely. for you all watching and um, being part of this, um, we would have stopped long ago. But um, because it's um, receiving some good attention and people are seem to be enjoying it and getting a lot of content out of it, um, you know, we hope to keep it going for um, the foreseeable future for sure. So definitely. Well, again, if you want to see any of those shows for the last, oh, I guess, 52 weeks, <laughs> um, you can go to from the woods today.com and um, see any of our shows there. They're, they're already posted and you can take a watch of those. And, you know, sometimes, Billy, I've told this before, you know, I forget what the, was the name of that or what was that. That way you can pause and rewind and you can hear us any time of night that you want to. Or yeah. day, so. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and a lot of great content on there for sure. And again, thank you all for being part of this um, show. We really appreciate appreciate it. Let us know what you'd like to see. You know, we have a, um, a little survey you can complete on fromthewoodstoday.com and you can let us know about some topics you'd like to see going forward. Right. Definitely. All right. Well, until then next week, uh, join us at 11 o'clock. Until then, take care. Bye, Bye everyone.